right, well, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Dana Atwood, and I'm the sociologist on the Sheboygan campus. We are here today to discuss our common read, Affluenza, the all-consuming epidemic written by John DeGroff, David Wayne, and Thomas Naylor. The authors basically propose in this book that Americans in general have become afflicted with a disease, okay? or we can also refer to it as an addiction, they've also referred to it as. And that over the last few decades, this disease has reached epidemic proportions. Now, what is this disease or epidemic? They call it, they refer to it as affluenza. In their words, as I have up here on the document camera, affluenza is a painful, contagious, socially transmitted condition of overload, debt, questions, the dog pursuit of more what? It wasn't happiness. Right? Well, right after the table of contacts, they give us a contact. And I can't see it really well, but they have a lot of stuff that have asked to bring in, if you, I'm sure I've seen them, they were asking stuff, all their stuff, I'm sure that's not all their stuff. And they have a, you can't see it really well because it's a document camera, but they have a lot less stuff. Right? So the more, as you pointed out, must be material possessions. The dog is the pursuit of more. More is material possessions. Okay. Or stuff. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me as I was reading the book, okay, that the premise of the book is that Americans have become hyper-consumers. We have entered the age of what sociologist Juliet Shore okay, refers to as the new consumption. According to Shore uh, in 1998, her book, Overspent Americans, we've developed this cycle of work and spend and that there's been a dramatic upscaling of what Thorstein Veblen refers to as conspicuous consumption since the late 1970s. Now, you're in the book, Affluenza, right? they talk often about, use the term conspicuous consumption, but this term was created by Thorstein Veblen in 1899. Okay. He's a classic sociologist, classic sociological concept, okay, um, to describe the relationship between social class and consumptive patterns in early United States history. In his book, The Theory of the Leisure Class, that was uh, published in 1899, Veblen described wealthy United States industrialists as engaging in what he referred to as conspicuous consumption. Basically, continuous conspicuous consumption, from his perspective, is a public display of wealth through material objects and leisure to signal comparative degree of social power. Okay. 
in order to attract public attention, what you can't see, um, according to Thurston Babelin, is, is bank accounts. Okay. And in order to attract public admiration, right, the wealthy top 20%, 1%, um, often engage in consumption and leisurely activities that are both highly visible and in affluenza and uh, Thurston Babelin also talks about highly wasteful. Okay. Examples of such highly visible uh, conspicuous consumption are Vanderbilt's eight lavish mountains, mansions, not mountains. Okay. Liberace's 30 cars, or he had hundreds of capes and one, what, thousands of capes, and one had jewels in it that reportedly weighed uh, 100 pounds. It's visible. Right? We have examples today of conspicuous consumption, and I'm sure that you can think of many examples of conspicuous consumption. Okay, how many people in the United States, and they, and this is often the Hummer, how many people need a big yellow Hummer to drive eight blocks, bring our kids to school, okay. okay. All right. The thing is, according to the, the read that we did, the, the book, okay, and many other economic theorists, conspicuous consumption is a behavior that has filtered down, okay, into other classes, okay. Indeed, your book talks about many families living on credit in order to purchase goods that are not necessarily needed for sustenance. Okay. In Shore's analysis, conspicuous consumption, or what she calls, and I use Shore because the book, Affluenza, uses Shore's, um, some of Shore's, Shore's theories, okay, and employs a lot of her research as examples throughout, uh, throughout the text of conspicuous consumption or materialism or in, in, um, work hours and a lot of examples to demonstrate, to provide evidence. Comes from her research, Juliet Shore. Okay. In Shore's analysis, conspicuous consumption, or what she calls, she calls it competitive consumption. Okay has existed throughout history. In America, old competitive consumption, the display of relatively valued material objects, she argued, is located in wealthier groups, okay, within wealth groups. During the post-World War II era, with the growth of suburbia, she argues, competitive consumption was equated to keeping up with the Joneses. In, in your book, they often also refer to keeping up with the Joneses. Our drive for more stuff is in part a result of our desire to keep up with our neighbors. Okay, you see what your neighbors got. You see what your neighbors have. Ah, oh, you know, they just put up, well, that's funny. They just put up a, um, you know, painted their house. Maybe I need to paint my house, okay. Too, and I'm going to paint my house and make it nicer. All right. Um, they just cut their lawn. I better cut my lawn to show civil, you know, civilization and separation from nature. But that's another point. Okay. In the old consumption that Shore talks about, she is referring to basically um, people competing for status and prestige through material objects with like reference groups, reference groups that were very similar. So in the post-World War II era when we were suburbanizing, um, the Joneses were the people who were just getting their new homes um, and they were looking at their neighbors, basically a homogenous neighborhoods. People had relatively the same amount of wealth and they were comparing and competing consumptively with people that had basically the same income and wealth. Okay. Now, um, they ba basically they see their neighbor buying a washing machine or a Chevy and they um, seek to emulate or to one-up 
their neighbor. Okay. However, Shore is arguing, and I think uh, your the book, the authors of this book, Affluenza, are arguing. Um, since 1970s, we see competitive consumption shifting out where Americans across the income spectrum are seeking to emulate the affluent, the people in the top o over six figures. And I like didn't have a chalkboard up here, so I just did a quick. Okay. Veblen was talking about the competitive consumption amongst the elite in the 18, you know, early 1900s and late 1800s amongst the elite upper classes where they would buy, um, one would buy, get a lavish mountain, another mountain, I don't know what that, that is, mansion, and another would um, try to uh, better them and they were competing because you can't see a bank account, you can't, you can't see that. So they were trying to say, we're better. Um, I have this great carriage. I can throw this great party. And their neighbors right, would then throw this great party <coughs> that tops them. Okay? But now, she argues, we're seeing a shifting down okay, of this competitive consumption into the mass society. All right? Now our models, she argues, are upscaled. Okay? We're no longer competing with like reference groups We're co within wealth. We're competing. Our consumptive patterns are in competition. We're competing for power and prestige and status through the material um, competition amongst groups that are way wealthier than we are. Okay. In her words, quote, Shores, the lifestyle of the top 20% has become the aspirational target now for the 80% below. Okay. Short argues that there are three factors that lead to this shift in the new consumerism. And I'm just going to quick touch on those, but that isn't one of, the main, one of my main points. But we can analyze these factors when we discuss toward the end of this presentation. Why did it speed up? Why did it change from old consumerism in the 70s to now? Okay. Women entering the workforce in greater numbers okay, was one of her, in, is in her theory. She argues that since the 1970s, women, women have entered the workforce in <coughs> greater numbers. Okay. And I was wondering, what, you know, what did that have to do with it? Is there an underlying assumption there, gendered assumption, right, that women spend more? <laughs> okay. Well, in fact, um, they do, but not that much. <laughs> okay. Women spend, at least in time hours, according to the uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics, 1.81 um, time shopping in general. Okay. Um, that's both for grocery shopping and consumer <coughs> shopping, with men, 1.55. Okay. Take that as you want, but we'll come back to that. But she was saying that them entering the workforce, women in general, okay, um, entering the workforce in greater numbers after they're, they're leaving their, she calls, they're leaving their coffee clutches, they're leaving their neighborhood, and they're being exposed to wider reference groups. Okay. They're being exposed to bosses and bosses' bosses and coworkers who are making variable income and they're talking about what they're spending and they're t what they're spending their money on and they're sharing their, their jewelry and their conspicuous consumption. And these no longer are these people who are homogenous as far as class is concerned. These are people who you have wider reference groups, wealthier people. You're comparing yourselves now to wealthier people. This is according to Short. Her second factor is the, that has sped it up is the growing economic inequality. Okay? The gap between the rich and the poor grows. Okay? From 1977 to 1999, and this is her analysis, the top 20% saw of wealth, wealthy individuals, wealthy groups, individuals, saw an 18% increase in just income alone. And she was using that analysis. And we can talk about that too. The mid 
60%, okay, a four, saw a 14% decline, okay, between 1977 and um, 1999. The top, the bottom 20%, a 25% decline. So the gap is growing. And income inequality, she argues, propels, okay, and other uh, sociologists and economic theorists argue that income inequality propels um, conspicuous consumption, okay? Because the top 20% are displaying, okay, there are a number of reasons for that, and we can talk about that later too, um, but the top 20% were obtaining more of the pie, they're display and they're displaying this in very public ways. Now, Entering the workforce and economic inequality isn't the only reason, and your book talks about uh, culture, okay? The media. The media, she says, promotes um, conspicuous consumption, the mass consumption, the mass upscaling of buying more and more stuff, okay? An increase in the media use is significant, 1970s um, to not 2000, what are we in, 2012, okay? 2010, in general, Americans were watching, uh, women were watching 3.22 hours of television, okay? Uh, men were watching uh, 3.66 hours per, tele per television a day, okay? And that's just television, okay? That doesn't include the internet, which is increasingly you know, bombarding us with advertisements, okay? In the media, sitcoms such as Friends present a fictional representation of what the consumptive norm is, okay? And we do find that a you know, number we, meaning uh, a number of <coughs> researchers, um, heavy TV view viewers tend to have an upward bias in their perceptions of what people have, okay? We're watching sitcoms such as Friends, and she uses that example in her presentation, um, uh, Shore does. We're watching sitcoms such as Friends, and what is, uh, somebody tell me, what is Friends? How many of you have seen Friends, the sitcom? Good, okay, so it is still a relevant example. Basically, where do these people live? New York City. New York City. What does their apartment look like? It's big, and do you think that that's <coughs> given, what, what do these people do? Drink coffee. They drink <laughs> coffee. <laughs> what? <laughs> what kind of, who does? Yeah, <laughs> Chandler. Later yeah. He yeah, he did, be, you know, he did move toward advertising, yeah. right? Yeah. And Joey is what? In a spite, he's not even making that much money. Come on. And well, what's the other woman do? She originally was. Oh, masseuse, right? Okay. Really, she, you know, sure is asking us. Are these people really going to be living in this situation? Yes, they're sharing an apartment. Okay, but. The buying patterns um, is overblown. It's over-exaggerated. This is not the norm, okay? People are watching these types of sitcoms, and Shore argues that there's a, many sitcoms that overblow. There, there are some that are not, but there are many sitcoms that overblow or misrepresent um, the median income uh, or the income for that family. And then when people are watching, they get an upward perception of, of what is the consumptive norm, how people are living, okay? <laughs> hoarding, yep, and then I, and I thought a lot about hoarding as I was reading this book and the show Hoarders, and we can talk about that, but I wanted to just give you an overview of basically what the argument of the book was in case you haven't read it. Um, or haven't had a chance yet to read it, and to give us an idea of, you know, remind us of what the basic premise of this book is. 
Okay. Now, not only are Americans um, engaging in this dog pursuit of more, it is important to note, and they provide a lot of evidence, and even Shore's arguing that it's contagious. Okay, it's a contagious disease, and I thought that was. That was something else. I was thinking the whole time I'm trying to, the weeks, for weeks, and a number of you knew how in, nervous I was. What were my goals for this presentation? What did I want to talk about? And I wanted to talk about, you know, questioning, the dog pursuit of more. I wanted to talk about and, and introduce you to the terms that are thrown around in the book that were um, sociological concepts and kind of give you a history of what they're you know, what kind of theories that they were actually presenting in their read, which I understand is to attract a greater audience, not just us sociologists, okay? But they also argue that this um, hyper mass consumerism, okay, is contagious, right? Dr. David Suzuki in a number of studies, books and books on globalization will argue that that is correct, and I have a little clip for you to talk about um, affluenza <coughs> being contagious. If I can think about how to do this. And she said I can use this. <laughs> See if it works. For three more minutes? Can I take three more minutes? A few years ago, I flew into a very remote village. My foundation's been working with uh, 13 First Nations villages in the remote part of the coast of British Columbia. And I flew into a village uh, of First Nations people called Clem Two. The Kitasu people live there. It can, there are no roads to it. It can only be reached by air or boat. There are 200 people in the entire village and when I was approaching Clem to I, I literally burst into tears. I had, had not thought that there was such vast forest still intact in the, on the west coast of Canada. And here was Kittisu territory, still completely intact, forest and ocean. When I landed, I was met by dozens of kids and people that welcomed me to, the, to their village and shown them to my place where I was staying with someone. And that evening, they had a huge feast in the community center. All 200 people were there. And this huge banquet table was groaning with halibut and salmon and crabs and clams and herring eggs and seaweed. We had this incredible feast. And at the end, Percy Starr, the band manager, got up and he said, he welcomed me and he said, we are very poor. We need development. And what he meant was we have to log and we have to, we have to bring in far, uh, salmon farms and uh, uh, we have to allow mining to come in. And when I got up, I, in my speech, I replied, you know, I come from a very rich part of Canada. I live in Vancouver. I live in a very expensive part of the city to, uh, it's called Kitsilano. In my one block, there are probably three times as many people that live in the entire village of, of Clem Two. And yet, uh, in the 25 years I've lived in that block, I've only come to know about 10 of the people in, around me. I have to lock my car because it's been broken into many times. My house has been uh, burgled three or four times. We have a park that's half a block away. My children weren't allowed to play in it at night because we were afraid for their safety. I couldn't with all my wealth ever put on a feast like the kind that people in Clem Two gave me that night. And they, and I said to them, you say you're poor to me. You are rich in community, and you are rich in your surrounding land that continues to deliver the kind of feast that we've eaten. In the process of trying to come into the modern world, for heaven's sake, don't give up the very things that matter most that we in the cities are yearning to rediscover. But a global economy renders people like that poor and makes them think that they have to destroy their surrounding land to acquire the, the trinkets that we think are the key to happiness. Do you know where the real rot lies? We'll, we'll, find, that, we'll find that out.
<laughs> the point is, is that Bullshore, your, your books, Affluenza, uh, many sociologists, Dr. David Suzuki, are concerned, okay, that affluenza, this mass um, seeking of uh, material objects, is problematic. And it's contagious, and it's problematic, and it contributes um, to the breakdown of families, it contributes to environmental degradation, okay, and we can, um, anxiety, lowered self-esteem, and we could go on with all the negative um, consequences that this being on a treadmill of consumption and production uh, produces. Okay. Now there are a couple of things that I wanted to note here um, as I was reading this and thinking about it. Interrelated, okay, and I couldn't decide on, on what I wanted to talk about, really, because they were talking about, so let's talk about, we could talk about our, our increasing debt, okay? We could talk about anxiety and the, and the work hours that we're spending, um, and that America has more work hours. We could talk about uh, the fact that this stuff does not buy us happiness, okay? We can talk about waste and environmental, in my environmental sociology, I talk about waste. We can talk about overpopulation and overconsumption. And I really was freaking out because I couldn't decide what my main point, what I wanted to talk about, okay? Well, I wanted to make a point that people, m many th theorists agree with um, your book. And in a part, I agree with it. But I want to, as a sociologist who studies race, class, and gender, gender. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it. I almost was going to. Um, be careful of universalizing experiences. Uh, one thing that I kept thinking about when I was reading the book over and over again, who's this we? Okay. <laughs> Americans, 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 right? Um, Americans vary <laughs> vastly <laughs> in, as they point out, in their income distribution, in their um, religious perspectives, in their um, age and race and ethnicity, okay? Different ethnic groups, okay? And there's ample research suggests within this heterogeneous society, consume at different rates, okay? Not everyone is seeking uh, this middle class. We also have people who are joining organizations and are very concerned about the environment and reject this hyper-consumerism. And your book does talk about that voluntary simplicity. So be careful of the universalizing experience and just keep that as you're reading Affluenza. I encourage you to just keep that in mind. Be careful of universalizing. Um, Many, evi much evidence suggests that gender differences will mediate our, our behavior, so will ethnic, um, religious, educational, um, age, okay? Many as elements of our social location will um, change, will alter our behavior. So we're not all the same, and, I had a, and we don't all spend time, okay, collecting stuff, all right? There's something else I was thinking in related to that. Much of the public of, is aware, okay, your book talks about this, the emptiness of stuff, material objects, and I think that's important um, to point out, the emptiness of material objects. Many people across the different spectrums are well, are also concerned in America about and understand the emptiness of stuff, in fact, uh, many religious traditions talk about the emptiness of stuff. So our religions influence our attitudes, or at least, okay. I don't know if you can see it, but American Indian, miserable as we seem in the eyes, we consider ourselves much happier than thou is that, that we very content with the little that we have. 
Christian, um, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, many religions, uh, poverty is my pride, Muhammad said that. Um, many religions tell us, inform us Americans, now I'm generalizing, that stuff, be wary of the emptiness of stuff. Okay, so here then I'm thinking about um, the simplicity of arguing that our consumptive patterns, our consumptive patterns of Americans, as all of us are growing, we're collecting stuff at a, at a great rate. And in a sense, I would agree, okay, but in another sense, I would ask you to just think about that. There's another thing I wanted to talk about. Okay, stuff, okay, more stuff. And when I first started, and this is gonna relate to him on the third point too, when I first started thinking about what I wanna talk about in relation to the text uh, from a sociological perspective, I really thought about universalizing race, class, gender, okay, and showing you different graphs, right? Then I was thinking about stuff, okay? What is stuff? What are the functions of stuff? And I started actually creating a PowerPoint, which I'm gonna talk about PowerPointing in a little bit as well. But I started thinking about the sociology of stuff. What are the different functions of stuff? Now one function certainly is status and prestige, okay? But there are other functions. of stuff, okay? As Michael Bell, he's an environmental sociologist and he wrote this book, Invitation, Invitation to Environmental Sociology. It's a really good book. Um, he states, there's more to people than a will to gain power and show off, okay? The goods we surround ourselves with show not only how we set ourselves apart from others, Veblen's point, Okay, but also how we connect ourselves to others. We can all give examples of this. Here are some of mine. Okay. It's a pig. <laughs> this is valuable. This is some of my stuff. Yes, it's a lot of stuff. We have a lot of stuff. As I'm moving and I'm talking to other people who are moving, you realize how much stuff you collect. Yes. But it's not all just display of status and prestige. This does not display my status and prestige. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it doesn't, even by your lap. It doesn't, right? right? But what this is, is something I made for my grandmother, okay, who I was very connected to, and I adored her. Okay? And she kept this. I made this when I was like in third grade. Right, in, in a sewing class. And she kept this for years and years and years and years. She had this pillow next to her when she died. Okay. This is my grandmother. This stuff isn't just stuff. It symbolizes the spirit of my grandmother. A wedding talks about um, wedding rings are a classic example of what the Maori people um, talk about, uh, the how of objects. Spirits are attached to gifts. Now they're talking about gifts. Uh, maybe we're talking about material objects that we're, we don't buy and that there's a distinction between gifts and stuff that we go out and just spend thoughtlessly, okay? But a lot of the stuff that the first family and the second family had outside that home in the first picture isn't just about status and prestige. That stuff holds memories. It holds and displays connections. It enhances our identities, it maintains social connections. A wedding ring, classic example of um, an object that doesn't that, that might be valuable, okay? <laughs> and we could talk about the expectations, monetary expectations of people who obtain wedding rings, right? You don't want it from a, um, probably it's not normative to get a wedding ring that's worth $3, okay? In our society, right? <laughs> right? And we could talk about that too, right? 
But stuff that's most valuable to me is stuff that you might, doesn't, you know, my boyfriend got me this last Easter. It's still, it was still on my TV, I noticed. I have a, I have a big screen. I, I just, this reminds me. Why, why is this? This reminds me of his thoughtfulness, okay? It's the first Easter basket that I had, I had received since I was little, okay? That was, that was thoughtful. It was, it's like a memory of an experience that connects me to him, right? And this, you know, I could go on and on about stuff. My son said, Mom, why do you have that picture? Okay, you're embarrassing me, okay? But I coll we collect stuff. I'm sure you can think about stuff that helps you remember others and connects you to other people. Okay. All right. So the functions of stuff. It doesn't just connect us or distance us or separate us from others. It also can make connections. And David Unruh, in his research on interviewing people who um, have been who are aware of their impending death, talk about um, strategies that people use to maintain their identity even after they die, and strategies that survivors use to maintain a connection with past uh, people in their lives, people who have moved on from this life. Part of those strategies was the accumulating of artifacts stuff, okay, and the distributing artifacts, okay, where you, you give somebody, you know, you know, I'm, people when they start to prepare for death and they're thinking awareness, they're aware that they're going to die soon, they're thinking about the things that are valuable to them and they tell stories about um, objects, okay, in hopes that these stories are going to be their identities, part of their storytelling is identity telling about themselves, and they're hoping that they're, they, they, they pass them along to family members, right, um, in hopes that they're going to be remembered, their identity is going to be remembered, okay. So stuff also provides social connections, all right. We want to keep that in mind, and I thought uh, Suzuki does a really good job of reminding us of that, I'm looking at the clock in his next statement. Economy. It's not just in the overemphasis on human cleverness and invention. It's not just the externalizing or discounting of the natural world. It's not just the belief in growth forever. It's not just, uh, uh, it's that it fails to even acknowledge that there are things of value that lie outside of economics that are priceless beyond worth or beyond price. I want to give you an idea. I've lived in this part of Vancouver now for 25 years. We call it our home. A few years ago, when money was pouring into Vancouver from Hong Kong, because Hong Kong was going to revert back to China, I got a letter in the mail that said, foreign money is flooding Vancouver. Now's a good time for you to sell your place and buy up. And I thought, what the hell are they talking about? This isn't my place to buy. This is my home. If I were to put this on the market, what are the things that I would list there that are worth something to me? So I began to make a list. When Tara and I were married 30 years ago, my father, the cabinet maker, made a cabin, a kitchen cabinet for our, our, our a cupboard for our, our kitchen. And when we moved to our home, I tore that cabinet out to put in my kitchen. It doesn't fit, but it's valuable to me because it's my father. Years ago, my best friend from Toronto came out to stay with me for a week. I was building a fence along the water, and he spent a day carving a beautiful handle, which I put on the gate. And every time I use that gate, I think of my friend Jim. And I put that down on my list. We have a dogwood tree out in the back. And we have a little cemetery there. We buried Pasha, our dog, there. And my kids have dragged in snakes and, and starlings and all kinds of critters that have died on the road, and we buried them there. And I put that cemetery down on my list. 
My father-in-law and mother-in-law live upstairs. He's a, a rabbit gardener and he knew that I love raspberries and asparagus and he's planted them in the garden for me. One year I'd been away for a month. When I came to the door, the first person to meet me was my father-in-law. He had a brown bag. He said, David, there's a first crop of asparagus and I saved it for you. And I put that down on my list. And my mother died and we put her ashes along the back fence where there's a clematis plant growing. And every year when that clematis plant blooms, I know that my mother is there. And when my niece Janice died prematurely, we put Janice's ashes there. And I put that down on my list. And as I looked over on to that, that list, I realized those are the things that make my place a home. How do you pay for any of that? When to put that on the market, those are absolutely worthless. They have no value at all. And I've only lived in my home for 25 years. You think of First Nations people that have lived on their land for thousands of years. Every rock, every river, every bend in the river is, is sacred and precious to them. That to me is the real rot that resides in the heart of economics. So what do we do? I believe we have to look beyond the rhetoric that shouts at us over and over, globalization is good, globalization brings a good life to all, globalization's wealth will trickle down to the poor. Okay. So the problem is not stuff, but more stuff, <laughs> okay? Or overvaluing stuff over what makes us really happy is connection. There was one more point I wanted, that um, I, I was going to just talk more about identity enhancement and the function of stuff. But there's another point I wanted to make that my son brought up, believe it or not, um, just the other day. As I was starting to prepare okay, for presenting uh, the common need you know, months ago, and I was getting closer and closer to the date. I was constructing a PowerPoint. All right, I want to share that. Okay, I had the first page, the sociology of stuff, and I and I thought of I was going to, you know, share with you history of holidays and how they've become over you know, focus on material items instead of how we lost that tradition. And I was getting video <coughs> clips and from YouTube and, and considering doing all that, okay. okay. But um, close to the end of the presentation, was, I had uh, a relative, you know, I was thinking more then of, um, you know, information and trying to gain information and just thinking about the information I wanted to connect with you and talk about, okay. So the other day I had my PowerPoint up on my laptop and my son came and looked at it and he goes, really mom? Okay. Um, I'm really concerned mom. You can't, you can't use this. You can't use that PowerPoint. And I thought that was really interesting. Here was something that talks about while I think that affluence is, I agree and I disagree with um, the premise of the book. My son was talking about who, by the way, wants to upgrade his phone, um, continually upgrade, how many of us want to continually upgrade our phones, okay? Or upgrade our cars, and my son tends to be, very, you know, pretty materialistic. And I said, what's, what's wrong with this? And he said, well, first of all, Mom, the only picture that's adequate is this, this one because it's clear. And you must have used the PowerPoint correctly when you put this uh, picture up there. Okay. And I said, well, how am I supposed to do it? And he picked up his laptop, and I didn't have PowerPoint on mine, okay, but he had it on his. And he started clicking a few buttons, and he had rotating... Um, pictures and uh, the, he had the Google thing breaking apart and he's like I'll make this really good for you mom okay 
because your traditional way of presenting material on the chalkboard, okay, or VHS, by the way, I had to make sure there was a VHS, is outdated, okay? And you're gonna look bad. And I came all the way around to, are we doing that to our teaching? <laughs> are we, you know, focused more on the presentation and entertainment value of our material and status and prestige? Of, of our presentations and less on connection and the quality of material. And that's what I wanted to then start talking about. Do you think we are? <laughs> what do you think? As educators, <coughs> do you think it's a, what do you think the functions are? It's not necessarily they have to be a negative function or a positive function, but the increase in upgrading our technological advancements of, you know, trying to keep up with the technological advancements. That isn't just an, I was able to individually challenge that, okay? Right, look at that. <laughs> okay. But it's in our structure. This overspending and overworking is in our social structure as well. We can challenge it, but structural arrangements some kind of constrain our ability to challenge these progressions. Okay. Well, I, I concluded the same thing. So in my intro class, I used to be I had a PowerPoint presentation for another activity, and you know, for every lecture, I had a PowerPoint presentation, and I, you know, I was just doing that because that's really supposed to be innovative or something, right? It's supposed to be, and I decided that it was just nonsense, and I still, now, I don't know, I'm just too busy. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, intro anyway, I don't use any PowerPoint, I don't use pretty much anything. It's in the overhead at all, we sit with a good text and discuss it. <laughs> right, that's mm -hmm. what we do. And, uh, and I like it a lot more, and I think it's a lot more productive in a way. Students are a lot less passive when we deal with that way, as opposed to the familiar history, right? The, the flashing lights, the entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going in just the opposite direction. I'm replacing right. myself with a robot. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we won't notice any different problems. <laughs> But here we're going to do merit reviews, right? When we do merit reviews, the use of technology and keeping up with the Joneses as far as education is concerned, okay, is considered a, po a positive uh, mark, okay? So it's part of our structure. What? <laughs> By many, right? Well, we need empirical evidence to support that and see, you know. <laughs> Any other ideas that came up from this? Go ahead. And in regard to education here, I'm not an educator, but it's not only the stuff that's being upgraded, but your students are. They're coming to you much more sophisticated than they might when I was um, an entering freshman or sophomore. Their expectations are very different. Their learning experiences have started mm -hmm. in kindergarten and have a computer. And I think if you're going to create a teachable moment, you may need to use it. There are a couple things I, I thought right away. Sophistication, what makes it more, right? Second, but they are coming at a different um, technological, with different technological socialization. They have different technological expertise. And are, aren't we somewhat responsible um, as educators to meet that, okay? Or at least meet them halfway, students, right? Not what they need to learn, this isn't a technical problem. Or are we responsible to show them alternative ways to actually learn? 
I wanted a chalkboard up here. I was upset that there wasn't one. Do you have to use the stuff engaged? Do you have to? That's a very good question. Right? Our news is going really quick. The, the children's the brain is developing within this environment, within this technological environment. Are they more equipped to deal with two second sound bites and flashy things? to obtain information? Are they no longer able to obtain the information in the class? Well, education is obtaining information. This okay, is good, education. good, good. It's good. learning how to think. Good. Right? And thinking in a little two second bites is not good thinking. <laughs> good, excellent. Right? Well, for instance, so I mean, other disciplines may be improvised, which <laughs> philosophy, I want them to think too. In a sustained, focused, deep manner, right? Right. So, it's in uh, helping it's them to engage in critical thought. I agree. That's my pedagogy too. Okay, I'm glad you uh, caught it. I have a factual right to thank you. Last night in Ohio, among people who voted, we earned over one hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> we didn't have our meeting. But perhaps it's interest <laughs> rather than stuff. Good. Thanks. Any other comments? Or go ahead. Uh, I have one just economics question about this. But just, just one good sociological question. Does affluenza alienate the from or integrate the with society? Does affluenza what? Alienate individuals from the society or integrate them with them? That's a good question. What do you all think? What? You can hardly. I I'm dapping them. Right. I could too. Okay. What does the text say? What does the text say? Suggests the text suggests that, that it isolates the it isolates us. We're increasingly isolated, and provides a lot of evidence to suggest that. Right. And we're spending more hours at work, so less time with our kids. Right. But. What? Isn't that integrated? I mean, what we're doing is we're upholding the values of the society. Right. Good. So that's integral uh, Good. rather than alienating. Of course, it may not be integrated to our what needs to be taken some, but it's fulfilling the needs of the society to grow. Yes, it is. Excellent. And after all, that's important. And that's the last question. I'm going to let you go because our time is up. What's important? Keep that in mind. Thank you.